Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence on the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here for checking out the series. You know what to do if you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week, a new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It makes it a great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover those new ones. You can get me any place you get podcasts from Spotify, Apple Podcast, NPR, WFPK.org. Consequence, YouTube right here for the video versions or anywhere you get your podcast from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. And that's me, Kyle Meredith. Today, we're going to be talking about the movie Damsel out now on Netflix. This is, uh, it stars Millie Bobby Brown, uh, Ray Winstone, Nick Robinson, uh, Brooke Carter, Angela Bassett's on here. Robin Wright is in here. And uh, I'll, I'll read the log line. A dutiful damsel agrees to marry a handsome prince only to find the royal family has recruited her as a sacrifice to repay an ancient debt. Thrown in a cave with a fire-breathing dragon, she must rely on her wits and will to survive. Uh, it's exciting to see Millie Bobby Brown in this one. And uh, today I get to talk with Nick Robinson and the director, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, uh, all about, so it, it's, a, it's not your average fairy tale. Let me say that. It flips the script. This is not a damsel in distress by any mean. In fact, what starts out uh, feeling a little bit, uh, a little bit fluffy, you know, a little bit fairy tale, he suddenly turns very, very dark bordering sometimes on horror thriller but uh, definitely exciting so we're going to hear all about that uh the characters the ideas the music all that and more so let's get into it and talk damsel out now on netflix it's kyle meredith with nick robinson and juan carlos fresnadi hey what's up kyle hello it's a pleasure to meet you on here likewise and uh yeah to congratulate you on uh, on the on really an exciting movie here with damsel thank you Thank yeah. you, man. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's been a minute. I'm like, uh, it's been a second since I've done press, so it's my first one back. So just, you know, getting the nerves out here. I like to help you work out the cobwebs a little bit. Yeah, I'm, exactly. Uh, Perfect. Good. Good for that. Well, I'll, I'll only ask you the good questions. We'll, we'll do none of the bad ones this time. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll start with the obvious place. Why this story? I think, you know, I was so, I was so attached with this story the first time that I read the script, you know? Because I think what Dan Mazet did was kind of something that I was looking for for a long time, which is a very unique and different take on, on a fairy tale, you know? And, and I've been a fan of these kind of stories since, since I was a kid, you know? And the way that he modernized and put the upside down uh, I mean, all the elements in the story are upside down in many ways, you know, because he touches in the story, he touches all the stereotypes about fairy tales and he completely put it in a different way, you know, the stepmother, the princess, the prince, the father, even the dragon, which, by the way, it's one of my favorite things in the, in the movie because, you know, I think we're introducing something new on this kind of character, because we real we realize, you know, when we watch the movie that it's not a monster, it's not a beast, it's something else. And there is a background story that I think is gonna surprise the audience in a very cool way. So, you know, I think all these elements were in the script from the beginning, and I was a big fan of that. And and I pushed for making this movie. So I was lucky. Yeah. I also love that it, it actually falls on the ear of the dragon. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, Nice coincidence for everyone, but uh, certainly helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, it's interesting because here you are, this prince, with complications. Mm -hmm. This is not the Disney prince. No. Uh, might be the easy place to start here, but how did you want to play this guy? Um, well, I think you nailed it. This is The whole movie is really about turning uh, prior expectations you may have seen about fantasy films, you know, uh, damsel in distress and uh, flipping it. And Prince Henry is very conflicted. He uh, is trying to balance uh, the traditions in his culture with his own morals. And those two are just coming into conflict the whole film. Um, so it was a fun character to play. There's a lot of uh, opportunity for uh, conflict, both internal and external. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, we got to film in some beautiful locations and uh, 
but Prince Henry is definitely not Prince Charming. <laughs> because you know, you you wonder about characters like this, or like, are they on a redemption story or anything like that? Because what we find out about him at the beginning, right from the beginning, is, I mean, there is, as you said, the culture. There's some self-preservation at play. Um, definitely, like he feels torn. I guess that's that's the way I feel about it. Is that what you wanted to project? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that it came across that way, uh, because he is. Uh, yeah, he's deeply conflicted and torn around these uh, traditions in this kingdom, um, and he doesn't want to go along with it. But like you said, there is a level of self-preservation. Uh, my mother, the queen, played by the amazing Robin Wright is um, not somebody to be messed with. So I think he wants to stay on his mom's good side and just do as he's told. Right. It also reminded me, uh, as maybe it should have, you know, I, I, was a, I was a kid in the 80s where the movies that we saw were dark, you know? They weren't always necessarily, like Never Ending Story wasn't a kid's movie, but it was, but it was a dark movie, you know? And allowed us to grab on us that you, you said, I think that you were kind of always attracted. Like, what, why do you think that was? Why do you think you were kind of always attracted to these darker type of fantasy things? I think, you know, I was so attracted to this because in some ways, all these kind of classic tales, all these kind of dark fantasy stories in some ways, they have uh, within like a metaphor or, or of something really important. And to me, Damsel is almost like the, the perfect, example of how with this kind of journey you deliver such a beautiful story about become about, about being free you know and how in some ways in order to to be an independent strong adult you have to free yourself about things from the past and i think that's something that elodie finds in this journey she has to overcome things from from her family she has to overcome things from the situation if she wants to survive and being free. So I think in some ways this, this movie is about a metaphor of freedom and how important it is. And obviously, you know, you have to pay a price for that freedom. And that implies, you know, to go through very difficult places like Elodie does in this movie. But I think that's kind of, um, that's kind of the process of being an adult, you know? And, and this story, I think, shows really well how this young woman becomes a, a real woman, a re an independent, strong woman, which, by the way, I think is touching like a generational thing, for sure, but I would say at the same time that this movie is for everybody, you know? Because I think Elodie represents the human spirit in, in many ways and, and, and the necessity of having a, com a proper coming of age in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. A story for our time, for all time, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. Oh. So when you do something like this, and especially on this first part of the movie, when everything is still a little bit bright and flowery, like, how do you keep something like this grounded? Which I, I, I do mean to say that you did, it does come across very grounded. Not It doesn't come across that over the top that I think it could have. Um, I think, you know, it's a lot of that has to do with... Uh... Juan Carlos, um, our director, and kind of the world that he built, he didn't want it to look like a traditional um, fairy tale. Uh, and we shot it in, in Portugal, and the, the architecture, the castles there, the, all the landscape, it felt fresh, it felt different, it felt like unfamiliar. Um, and I think that played a part in, I don't know, having the film feel like a fully formed uh, place and vision um, and, and grounding it. Um, and yeah, I think for you just, for Henry, you're just trying to, he's just trying to get by day to day. He's just trying to survive in this world. And so you play into that, I guess, as much as you can and away from some of the fairy tale uh, tropes. Right. You've done it before, but getting to play what ultimately is a darker character, how natural does that come for you? Um, it's uh, just, you know, just like waking up in the morning. It's just, no, nah. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it's different. It's fun to be able to play different characters. I mean, that is, that's the joy of acting, is to be able to play someone that's different from yourself, be put into situations that you would never normally be put into. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, this was no different. This just felt like a fun challenge. Um, I'd never done a period piece like this before. It's high fantasy, it's castles, it's dragons. Um, and finding ways to, like you said, ground the character and, uh, and, and you know, also play this uh, ultimately villainous guy, but not try not tip your hand too much. Um, it was a fun balance. Yeah. And, and I guess what I'm getting through is like, I was thinking back on, uh, on Maid, mm -hmm. like, which is a much darker, <laughs> much darker, much darker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, do you ever consider, you know, cause it's the job, it's the job and it's the fun part of the job. Right. But there's also those perceptions of the audience and who they have of you. And, and you like, does that ever cross your mind? Like, like this is people latch onto these characters, right? For sure. That's truth. I, I think, um, I think for me, it's it's uh, it's hard to plan anything out in advance. It's hard to have some kind of uh, some some you know master plan or trying to control how audiences or people look at you. I think I'm just going into each role, just trying to have fun and and bring as much life to the character as possible. And um, yeah, I think part of the uh, the hope is that you can jump around and play different characters, good guys, bad guys, somewhere in between. And um, uh, so you're not pigeonholed in any way. And um, so I think that's consciously or not, maybe that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Do you, when you get a character, do you feel like you need that character to have a redemption of any sort? Does that matter to you? Um, not necessarily. I think uh, if it serves the story for the character to not be redeemed, um, I'm game. It's uh, it's really more about it's a team sport, you know. So it's not about just one character. It's about the whole uh, picture, and um, so it just really depends on the project and and the story that you're telling. Yeah. Well, I, I was, um, you know, as you, Prince Henry. Wondering if there's any relation to uh, to Henry VIII, if that was uh, talked about at all, because it feels like there's a lot of. Uh... Are you saying I look like Henry VIII in this movie? I'm a little offended. Uh, I don't even know what Henry VIII looks like, but he sure was killing some wives. He really was. He really was. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, that never actually. Um, that never came up in conversation. But it's an interesting point. You know, I don't think there was ever meant to be a direct historical. Uh, tie to any of this. This is all pure fantasy. Um, any connection to anyone living or dead is, you know, pure uh, coincidence. Fine print at the bottom, right? That's, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Let me start these rumors now. I don't know how far this rumor is going to go, but... Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's got legs, I think. It's, it's, it's going places. History nerds are going to love it, I tell you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with it, as you're talking about the, these flips and, and, and the story you get to tell, I mean, there's also this... this history of feminism, you know, when, when Millie lands in the cave and, and you have, you know, all these other women before her that have written the names and, and, and you find that throughout history of women helping women. And it feels like, like, uh, how do I want to phrase it? Like, obviously that's an important story to tell. How did you want to tell that side of it? I think, you know, first of all, I think it's really important to mention the fact that, you know, for the first time in these kind of stories, you see how this princess has to save herself, you know? So there is nobody coming to this case to rescue her, and she has to figure it out the way to, you know, to escape from there. And escaping from this hell place implies to face the dragon and, you know, and literally fight with him, you know, with her in this case. I, I, don't, I don't want to give a big spoiler about that, but, you know, I think it's really important, you know, the, the, the idea that the only way to survive uh, depends on you. And this kind of solitude that we have in the story for a long time in, in, in the movie, I think it's, it's I would say it's, it's the heart of the story. And, and that's why I was so happy with Millie, because I think she really fleshed out in an amazing way this, this kind of quality on, on, on the survival experience, you know. And... Obviously, when she found that there were other women in these caves, and in some ways they were trying to help to each other with some kind of signs and, and, and a map, 
I think we create like a beautiful sorority among them, which I think it's also a very important element in the story, you know, how, as you mentioned, how women help women. And I think in this kind of, you know, context, we kind of witness with this kind of help how in some ways this is like a birth of a new heroine, you know, and Elodie represents all these women fighting in those caves and in some ways it's kind of a poetic justice about what happened, you know. Right. And and you kept her grounded. Like, I feel like it would have been easy for a lot of stories, of course, to make her Wonder Woman, you know, or, or something like that. But but you chose the different routes on this. And I'd love to hear, you know, sort of about that that side of things as well, because because she is she's very grounded in a movie that could that. I mean, it's still a heightened movie. Don't get me wrong. But it still pulls very close. Yeah, and I, and I and I think you know that that's as I as I as I mentioned before, you know, the heart of the story in some ways is a survival experience. And one of the things that Millie and I discussed in the in the shooting was that we have to see through her eyes, through her physicality, how she is surviving. I mean, we cannot cheat this to the audience. We have to literally show how difficult is surviving in this kind of environment, especially when you have a dragon chasing you, you know? So I think that keeps the whole thing very grounded. And also, you know, the whole crew, and we, we, we had like a mantra in this movie, which was kind of funny because, you know, it was a persisting idea that I was look, chasing all the time, which is the fact that no matter if this is a fantasy movie, no matter if this is a, uh, a kind of fable in many ways, we have to feel it real. We have to f almost feel that we're watching a National Geographic documentary, you know, in terms of how it looks, how the monster, how, how the dragon looks like. And all these elements, you know, makes the whole thing real and which I think it's part of the, of, of the DNA of a good story in many ways. You have to convey that reality in order to put the audience in, 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 in almost in the front seat of the experience, you know. Once she falls in that cave and the movie becomes a, a tonal shift um, and there's so much, it's just, it's like a one-on-one. -on -one. What was that experience like I, I, for the both of you? I don't know how much you can speak for Millie, but, uh, but, but to be, you know, in this cave and, and it really just becomes us and her and that's it for a long time. Yeah. Almost like 25 minutes, if I remember well, you know. To be completely honest with you, I, I was a little bit afraid when, when I was prepping this because it's, it's kind of a test for the movie. It, it implies that you have to literally, you're naked suddenly because we were in this beautiful kingdom with this beautiful place and suddenly you're in a hole, a dark hole with nothing. <laughs> so I think it, as a, as a filmmaker, was a huge challenge, you know. And Obviously, for Millie, you know, she accepted this challenge in a brave way because there's nothing that she can deal with in that situation, you know. She only has, like, this voice chasing her and this dragon, this presence and the fire and the whole thing. But you don't see and there is no way to have a relationship in this place. So she, she's there by herself. So it is a very tricky area in this movie because you have to build the survival experience experience step by step and you have to make the audience feel that you're that they are there and they are kind of witnessing that in such a intimate way so for me the key element on this section of the movie was to properly create some sort of intimacy with Elodie and that's why the camera is so close to her all the way through even even when the dragon is attacking her the camera is so close to her which by the way, it was a, another challenge for Millie because, you know, she had to do many of the, of the stunts that we did in the movie because we were there and, you know, you, you're seeing her face. So, yes, the, the, the element, the key point here was to create that intimacy in order to witness how she is preparing herself to become the fighter that she finally becomes at the end of the movie, you know. Yeah. Did did she have the voice to play off of by that point? The, the dragon's voice was that there yet? Yes, she had the voice. Not not everything because we were kind of changing many things uh, along the way, but 
uh, she had like a big reference and, and most importantly, what she had at the time was the spirit that we wanted to convey, you know? And, but as you can imagine, you are in front of a green screen with a guy with a wire and a little bubble and, and a light, and you don't have anything else. So you have to figure it out the whole thing there. And that's why I'm so impressed every, every time that I, that, I, that I watch the movie, because, you know, literally Millie, as we said in the shooting, she is literally watching a dragon, you know? She, you could see in her eyes how she's completely uh, petrified uh, about the presence of this dragon. No? Yeah, it's impressive, by the way, the dragon is. And based off of a cat, is that right? I would say like a feline. I would say like a lioness, you know? Like a wounded lioness. That, that's, that's, why, that's what I would say that in terms of the pitch that we created for the dragon, that was always the idea. Like a, a, a wounded lioness who, who is really, you know, uh, full of rage and revenge. And, and that's why I really love, you know, the turning point on her, because suddenly you discover another face of the dragon, which I think is really emotional. I, I see your beautiful photography that you post online, and it really is just wonderful. Thank you. So uh, that's, going... that's a big compliment for me, let me tell you, because photography for me is like my inspiration. So when I'm, when I'm, every time that I finish something or every time that I'm thinking about a script, I, I, I go to the streets to take pictures, and that's my that's my that's my kind of meditation, creative meditation, I would say. What did you find that you were so for this movie? I guess I'll, I'll put that that one in play. Like, what did you find that you were shooting in those moments of meditation, and how did you want it to look? Um, you know, the the tone of it, the look of it, because it does have a very strong look throughout it. Yeah, I think, you know, one, one of the big things that I discussed with Larry Fon, the director of photography, was the fact that we wanted to shoot this movie in a very special and unique way. And, and, and in this kind of a spirit to put everything upside down, we decided to show the kingdom, the kind of evil kingdom in this movie, we decided to do it just in the opposite way, meaning that it has to be so beautiful, it has to be almost like a full of gold light, you know, and it has to be mesmerizing, you know, you, you have to be kind of hypnotized by, by the beauty of this place. So that's why, um, you know, we decided to use this kind of palette of golden colors in, in the Orient Kingdom, because as, as much as we, tr we, I mean, if we push, you know, everything in that direction, then when you are in the, in the caves, you feel the darkest, time in this movie you know I, I think the contrast is so is huge and you can sense you know the, the the horror of being in this situation so definitely you know Portugal also played an important role in this photography you know because the light the places the landscapes there are so special and gives you kind of a, an original take on these kind of kingdoms because normally you know when when the dark fantasy tales think about locations they usually tend to go to a kind of bleak places you know but portugal is just the opposite P portugal is flamboyant in all the lemons and in, in, in all the senses you know and 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 i think that was an important part of the story and i'm so happy that you know they they accepted to i mean this netflix accepted to go there and shoot the movie because i i think it's it elevates the whole thing into a different level yeah I love that. And I wanted to quickly bring up the uh, the music, uh, Licky Lee, covering Ring of Fire. Yes, I'm so happy. How did happy. that come together? I mean, the, lyri the lyrics of that song, I think, reflects the movie in many ways, in some sort of ironic and fun way. So I, I was really happy when Licky accepted the, 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 the challenge of making this cover, and she did an amazing job. And, and, and I'm so happy to share that with the audience. So... So I think we, we, we were lucky, you know, to have her in the movie. Yeah. Do you ever go into these moments with something like that in mind already, uh, musically speaking? I like, you know, to be inspired by music when I'm prepping, for sure. And I love to have multiple conversations with the composer about, you know, the kind of take that we would do in every single scene. But it took a time, you know, uh, to really know what we wanted for the movie because, you know, um, the process of the visual effects and the, the whole editing was really long and, 
and and it, it sometimes is difficult to handle the whole thing. So fortunately, we had David, you know, the, the composer and the big help of Hans Zimmer too. But I think what David Fleming did was such a beautiful thing because I think he completely translated something that we discussed from the very beginning in the process, which was the fact that the music has to reflect every single step on the way in terms of the in terms of the Elodie journey. The music has to reflect to reflect her heart, what she's feeling in every single scene. And I think he did a great job about that because you can feel that what the music is telling you is completely related with her, with Elodie, which I think points, which I think pushes so high, you know, the emotional level of the story. There are great moments though. I mean, shooting the ceremony and those masks, I mean, it is almost like that immediately becomes a different movie, <clears throat> you know. Totally. Like, it, I would love to hear about that. Like, you know, because one, it, you know, there is a moment where I'm thinking eyes wide shut with it. You can't with those masks anymore. That movie just did it for masks forever, mm -hmm. I think. But, uh, but like, what was it shooting on that day? Because, you know, for as much as it feels like a tonal shift for us, you know, for you all, what was it the same? Um. It, it, it was. I, that was the scene I was most excited to shoot, and that was the scene in the script that got me most excited for the film, period. At first, uh, when I was first reading it, I thought it was going in a more traditional fairy tale route. And when that uh, sequence comes up, that to me was what made the film interesting and exciting, um, was being able to... Uh, play with audiences' expectations. Um, and it was, uh, it was one of the first things we shot, actually. So I didn't have anything to compare it to uh, prior, but um, it, was, uh, it was a fun scene. It, the, the set design was incredible, and those masks, like you said, were pretty spooky. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it uh, yeah, it felt like, a, um, a, it felt like a fresh idea. It's something that I hadn't seen before with, uh, you know, the, to quite that level of, um, of scariness, I guess is the right word. Yeah. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was cool. Um, but I think, yeah, it felt like, since that was one of the first things that we shot, it felt like everything after that was a different movie. It was like, oh, we're gonna shoot like a scary thriller. And then it, after everything changed and we started doing horseback riding through the hills of Portugal. It's like, oh wait, what, this, is, this is different. Um, you know how to ride a horse? I've been learning actually. There's a, a job I've been learning for recently. There's a, I'm, I'm doing a Western uh, next. So I've been doing a lot of horseback riding lessons. So I'm, I'm getting there. I wouldn't say I'm a pro yeah. or anything, but I'm getting there. Yeah, it's a fun one. Uh, I was looking at some of that stuff. Uh, what, Snack Shack, that trailer just dropped? Yeah, yeah, that came out uh, a few days ago, I think, or a week ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm and excited. And then it's I saw... also a fun movie. Yeah. I think there uh, are some screenings happening uh, next week in L.A. I don't know when this is released, but um, I think uh, m m March 6th, maybe? Mm. But mm. So yeah. if anyone's listening... Damsel, Snack Shack. God, I hope people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, I, I know where it gets the clock here. Um, I, I did want to ask, what was it like being part of a uh, History of the World Part Two? Oh, it was fun. That was that was like for me. I, I grew up watching Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, and um, just to be a part of that world in a small way was just something I couldn't pass up, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and just all the, I mean, it's like everybody, anybody that's funny, even moderately funny, yeah. like just seemed like everybody a part of that. Like, yeah. yeah, every comedian who's worked in the last like 30 years is, does a small part. And that was also, it was cool. It was a, it was a fun, it was just a fun environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you look lucky enough to, to get to work with some incredible people. And that goes back to Damsel here too. I mean, Robin Wright, Angela Bassett, Millie Bobby Brown. Like, I don't know what you can say, like, if, if casts feel different, because maybe they do, and maybe, you know, job to job, sometimes it blurs together, but there seems like when you've got 
this crew together. Apologies for the generic part of this question, but but what was that like this round? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're heavy hitters, everybody. Ray Winstone. Um, uh, and by the time the cast had fully rounded out, I just, that was also part of the thing. I was so excited to get to work with all of these titans, you know? I mean, it was, uh, it was a fun, like, it, yeah, it was great. I mean, everyone um, from Robin and Millie, Angela, Ray, like, and we all got to um, actually spend time together when we were shooting out in the country in Portugal, and um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun, yeah. It was like yeah. definitely one of the reasons, one of the big perks, I think, of this, of this job was getting to hang out with that group. Jeez, Portugal. Here's your job. Come to Portugal. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Not a bad way <laughs> to make a living. Yeah. Um, it is a beautiful movie. It is an exciting movie. Congrats again on uh, on what you've accomplished here. And and seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, likewise. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.